turning a regulatory agency into a self-conscious, changing, and evolving actor in American politics. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to participate in launching Reputation and Power, which, as you've already heard, is and will remain the monument to the first hundred years of the Food and Drug Administration's complex history. My colleagues have already praised some of the book's exceptional contributions. I'd like to add my own perspectives from two additional standpoints. First, simply as a reader of works on regulation and regulatory politics. And second, as someone specifically concerned with the role of knowledge and knowledge making in centers of governmental power. I'll end by posing questions, which I hope will begin a conversation that reaches well beyond this room and far beyond this afternoon's festivities. Dad's emphasis on narrative is to me the most salient contribution that this book makes to studies of regulation and organizational behavior. Dan's account unfolds. It resists reduction. Everything has a connection to a past and a future. So it's not only about history, it's about those connections that make each minute count together with the next step of one to four. Explanations. Nor did the sentences in the narrative lack purpose. So, for example, I wonder where Dan was going when he talked early in the book about the initial framing of the elixir sulfonilamide episode being framed in terms of blood sexuality and then discovered several pages later that this was the prelude to the reframing of the event in terms of gender, class, and culpability, or the lack of it. A they-should-have-known-better story was thereby retold as a story of innocent victimhood. Episode became tragedy, the kind of tragedy that could devastate any of our lives. In the process of tracing that reframing, Dan affirms the power of narrative as an instrument of political explanation. It's that crucial early reframing that motivated certain important changes in public policy, and that helps explain how FDA got the pre-market powers that it had review powers that it had long stopped. That success in turn started a long cascade of events that positioned FDA not only as America's highly reputed pharmaceutical regulator, but as the go-to regulatory model for the world's governmental authorities. Another feature of the book that appeals to me particularly is Dan's attentiveness to the ways in which knowledge is produced and transmitted in a regulatory agency. Reputation in the FDA's case is linked from early on to the agency's expertise, and Dan makes a profoundly interesting metaphysical point when he shows how FDA's reputation for expertise was consolidated around the 1938 period when the agency became something like the gold standard watchdog that it later came to be. Indeed, a subtitle for this book, for the movie version perhaps, could be On Becoming FDA. The FDA's authority, Dan argues, needed a new construct for which the agency could claim sole responsibility. That construct was the new drug. A new drug is not a natural kind, something like out there in the world for anyone to stumble upon. It requires building an entire edifice of knowledge to bring a new, dr new drug to market, and indeed into our system of consciousness. A system of standardized protocols, criteria, assessment methods, and the institutions to back them up within the agency, as well as networked into the outside world. This sort of heterogeneous construction is familiar to all those who have studied knowledge making in scientific laboratories, but I've rarely seen such a demonstration done with such superlative attention to the craft work of governing. In this respect, Dan, among numerous others, your book is a salient contribution to science and technology studies. One place where Dan's approach pays off strikingly is in his retelling of the thalidomide story that gives the book its cover picture, in case you haven't seen it. Frances Oldham Kelsey, the unexpected heroine of FDA's first regulatory century, did, didn't just happen from nowhere, much though later accounts have sought to represent her as a lucky accident, a plucky figure of American rectitude, and a public servant without compare. Dan shows that, her, that Kelsey and her husband, the second and lesser known Kelsey, came from a scientific background and intellectual and social roots that primed Francis to be suspicious in certain ways about certain kinds of claims. 
Dan sums up the point as follows, quote, well before the reports began to arrive from Germany and Australia, tying thalidomide to birth defects then, Francis Kelsey's chilly reception for thalidomide was legitimized within the Bureau as standard practice. Kelsey's personal reputation, in other words, was built upon a foundation of internal agency practice that both shaped and was reinforced by FDA's reputation for getting things right when others were getting them most unfortunately wrong. Of course, as in the case of little Joey Nidefer, whose death at six reframed the sulfonylamide episode into a national tragedy, it didn't hurt the agency to have a face to attach to its reputation for unflinching public service. This very brief spotlighting of some books many riches brings me to the three questions I want to pose to Dan and that I will, I hope, serve as a longer term as longer term conversation topics. They touch respectively <coughs> on epistemic theory, political theory, and moral theory. On the epistemic front, the book opens up a fascinating vein of inquiry in pointing out that FDA has experienced and perhaps helped to initiate a transition from an era of promise and promising safety for pharmaceutical drug use to an era of managing risk. In terms familiar to those who study science for a living, we would see this as a period of change or emergence when the dynamics of co-producing knowledge and society are laid bare and the epistemic material normative settlements of one era show their fragility and may come unstuck as times change. How in particular do the expert structures created under one kind of dispensation live up to the challenges of another? In some ways, the 1938 framing of the agency's role may have been easier for government experts to live up to. As long as safety was the primary concern, their tasks may have been relatively clearer. One could be cautious in situations of uncertainty, play good cop or bad cop as a case demanded, and surround one's approvals with warnings to guard against <coughs> obvious culpability. In the era of risk management, by contrast, agency actions are predicated on the assessment of certainty more depends on evaluating such intangibles as patient compliance than the behavior of pharmaceuticals in bodies, and at least potentially, a lot more of the regulator's reputation rests on exercises of judgment than on demonstrable scientific fact. So this leads me to wonder how and whether all the careful work of creating an expert apparatus of testing, screening, and evaluation carried out in the era of ensuring safety will carry over to the era of risk management. <coughs> to what extent is the institutionalized residue of that earlier era capable of guarding FDA's reputation in its present, less tidy, epistemic context? 